Yeah, we're preparing. Okay, we're good. Oh, we've got Mark David, we've got Don, we've got Nick, we've got Yell. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh. It's great to see you all. Oh, look at we got people yeah. in Mark David's studio as well. Hello, guys. Good. <laughs> um, um, keep in mind, we'll also have people on YouTube as well. Great. Hi, Hi Chris Valanti. How are you? Hi, Jane. I'm very good. How are you? <laughs> Hi, everyone. We're going to try to keep our videos on this time. I know normally we turn them off, but I think Jake would like to be able to see all your lovely faces. <laughs> so, let's, and uh, what I'll do is uh, we'll check to see if it if interferes with the YouTube stream. And if for some reason everyone's faces are still there, then we'll ask everyone to turn their videos off. But we're going to stick with on for this time. Well, that's great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the uh, last of the AI talks uh, for this semester, and we're very happy to be hosting uh, Jake Elways, who's going to be introduced by Jane in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, though, I would, of course, like to do the um, land acknowledgement. And I have to say that we're all very grateful, and we recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located and that precede the establishment of the university. We acknowledge our presence on the territory, uh, on the ter sorry, we acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tecoronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. And it is now uh, home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And this territory is subject to the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an, agreeably, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region for which we are very grateful. Uh, in addition, the Department of Computational Arts in AMPD would also like to acknowledge the virtual networks on which our activities and gatherings are cited, which is a product of Silicon Valley and Zoom which are located in the Muakma and Ohlone territories. So thank you. And with that, I would like to turn uh, the introduction over to Jane. Hello, thank you, thank you, Michael. Um, so it's with great, great pleasure uh, that I introduce you today to London-based new media artist, Jake Elwes. Um, so I first ran across Jake's work when browsing through this year's Ars Electronica website, and I was very excited when I saw it. Uh, and for those of you who are unaware of this festival, Ars Electronica has run every September since about 1979. Um, and it specializes in showcasing and supporting artworks at the intersection of art, science, technology, and culture and society. Um, so this year's theme, as Michael just mentioned, uh, for the digital media lecture series has been on the subject of AI and has showcased artists and artworks that critically engage with important problematics inherent to how AI is both trained um, and used in contemporary society. So Jake's work fits really nicely into this year's theme. Um, and they are here today to discuss their latest works, which focus on, uh, with a focus on the Gigi project. Did I say that right, Zizi or Gigi? Is it Zizi? Zizi. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> um, and this, the ZZ project explores the intersection of artificial intelligence and drag performance and finds ways of querying the data set. So just a little bit about Jake. Um, they are a media artist who is both living and working in London. They studied at the Slade School of Fine Arts in the UK and has seen much success over the years. Um, their works have been exhibited in prestigious galleries and museums worldwide, including ZKM in uh, Germany, Tank Museum in Shanghai, uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh Futures Institute in the UK, um, and of course, Ars Electronica in Austria, just to name a few. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome Jake all the way from London. So thank you for staying up late for us. We really appreciate that. And uh, thank you for giving us this presentation. Oh, you're so welcome. And thanks for inviting me. And yeah, it's, time difference is a bit strange, actually. I, I've probably done a few of these, but yeah, this one especially, I think kind of going the other way and <laughs> zapping to you across Zoom. But anyway, I'm going to share my screen now um, and show you a few slides. So hopefully, let's see. 
and I now, oh yeah, there we go. I can still see, perfect. So yeah, my name is Jake Elwes. Um, I'm a media artist. I'm, I'm based in London. And as Jane says, I've kind of been exhibiting my work um, around internationally. And um, I guess, yeah, I've, I've kind of been working with this like medium of artificial intelligence for a while. And I, I know kind of disclaimer straight from the start, I think artificial intelligence is actually a very washy term. Um, I think a lot of people don't quite know what they're talking about when they say AI or what the limits or bounds of that term is. Um, so in a way, I often prefer to use the term machine learning. Um, there's actually a brilliant artist, Memo Acton, who, who made a Chrome extension for every time the AI came up on the internet in like a news headline, it would change it to data-driven methods, <laughs> which I quite like. <laughs> Google create a new data data-driven methods, uh, you know, take our jobs. Um, so yeah, I prefer talking about machine learning, which is the sort of pragmatic approach, the actual processes involved in what we are doing when we're talking about AI in big data um, and analyzing some of the ethics and politics and processes behind that in my art. Um, so I'm gonna take you on a little tour for a few of my different works. Um, first off, actually, I'm gonna show you this image here is actually a circuit board, which has been run through a printing press at my very kind of old fashioned traditional art school, um, the Slade School of Art, which is in London, kind of in, in the center of UCL, kind of really old campus in the center quad. And there are kind of printing presses there that have been used by Paul Arago and by Lucian Freud and kind of shoving my computer circuitry through this press kind of felt quite like prescient move to me because I'm sort of so often behind my screen. It was quite nice to actually <laughs> make something analog since I was in such a famous painting school. Um, but for the most part, I was in the basement kind of coding on my laptop and trying to stay up to date and research how machine learning papers, methods, how, how these things were kind of working. And some of the ideas which came up within that, I think, excited me so much as an artist. Um, so anyway, I'm going to start off by showing you a little video, which is actually a little bit of a tangent. This is a video um, called Dada Data. And it's basically taking the 20 most successful um, influential figures in technology um, from Forbes list of influential figures in technology. And they're basically, as you might notice, all cishet white men, uh, I think apart from one, Jack Ma in China. Um, and yeah, here we go. So this is a video that I've created in a collaboration with an artificial intelligence, with a machine learning network, with a narrow AI, whose job it was to transcribe every word they said. And then I wrote a program to extract the numbers that they said in the order that they said them. So here's the resulting video. Five, six, five, 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 four, five, four, one, six, six, seven, 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 eight, eight, nine, nine, five thousand. One billion, one thirty million, one hundred million, two billion, one, two hundred. Two hundred fifty, seventy, one, ten thousand, one hundred fifty, ten thousand, eighteen thousand, one, ten, sixteen, sixteen, two, three hundred fifty, twenty hundred, two, 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 twenty, three hundred fifty, fifty, ten, fifty, nine thousand, nine thousand, one thousand, one six billion, hundred million, hundred million, one hundred million, six hundred, one hundred million, one, one, ten billion, five, thirty million, one, three, two, twenty. 27 million to 100. One. One. Five, 30,000. Zero. One. Ten. Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Three. Three. Three or four hundred billion. One tr trillion. Three hundred and eighty two. Three hundred and fifty thousand. Three hundred and fifty four. 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 Twenty. Ten. Or one. Three. Trillion. Seventeen. Four hundred. Trillions. And five. Millions. One. Tens. Thousands. Millions. And five hundred. Billion. Fifteen. Four. Six. Trillion. Two million. Five thousand. Fifty. Billion. Sixty. Four. Fifty five. One billion. Eighty. Forty. Ten. Zero. Three. One. Four hundred million. Four billion. One. Four. Billion 1980s. One, one four billion 1980s. Three hundred million ten fifteen billion. Thirteen thousand one thousand five hundred one thousand five hundred twenty five million one billion 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 two billion two seven billion four four billion one 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 eighty five ten ten four hundred million twenty four forty five one ten five 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 hundred billion two hundred fifteen hundred thousand hundred one two three twenty two thirty one two thousand sixty five thousand 35, 30, 35. There we go. <laughs> we'll stop there. Um, but yeah, it goes on for quite some time. Um, I'm just going to quickly check that I've still got my... I actually see the messages. But um, is, is, the, is, the, is the videos playing okay? Just to quickly check in, Jane. Cool. Fantastic. And I don't know if people... It's very sweet you've kept your videos up, but um, I don't know if that's showing up wrong on YouTube. If, Jane, if, if they, you want them to turn them off or... Perfectly. Um, I think they've right. 
not an issue. Perfect. All right. Well, I shall storm on. Um, but yeah, I guess this piece in a way, it's kind of, again, thinking at this from a different angle. So, so much art is being generated at the moment using generative adversarial networks. You might have seen kind of star transfer methods, deep fake methods, um, but actually to use AI in a different way to kind of actually try and critique and investigate, you know, who is creating these systems and who they're being created for. So I think that's often a central question to my work. It's like, who's creating these systems? Who are they being created for? Um, what are the limitations of them? Uh, taking sort of standardized models and looking at how limited they are, who they represent, who they don't represent. So obviously this is a video, a little video about a bunch of white men obsessed with their numbers um, and they are the people who are creating these systems. So that was Dada data from back in 2016. Um, so moving on, I kind of want to try and unpick a little bit some of the techniques which I am using as an artist. Um, I don't know how familiar everyone is, sorry if you kind of know all of these concepts already, um, but it is quite a complex field to actually sort of get your head around and it took me a long time coming from a traditional art background. I mean, I was always coding and I do all the code myself, um, but you know, it's more hacky and actually getting your head around some of the more philosophical, conceptual, theoretical aspects of machine learning is a bit trickier. Um, and of course, we always want to kind of give narrative to that. We want to try and understand it in the most simplistic way where we don't have to necessarily look at mathematical formulas and understand the most dense, convoluted academic papers. Um, the way that we often tend to do that is by anthropomorphizing AI, is by humanizing it, which I actually think is a big mistake. Um, so in a way, a lot of my practice over the last few years has been researching ways of, as an artist, communicating in a simplistic enough way what I've understood, <laughs> not as a scientist, but as an artist, of what AI is and means and how machine learning and deep learning work, um, but using different metaphors and different narratives. So. Uh, I'm aware that I often contradict myself and quite often I go back to those narratives, but I try and do it in a slightly knowing tongue in cheek way. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna talk about a couple of concepts in AI, which really excited me when I first found out about them. And this was back in Berlin in 2016, had an amazing um, educator called Gene Kogan, who's just an extraordinary guy. He ran a course called Machine Learning for Artists um, at the School of Machines Making and Make Belief in Berlin. <laughs> it's a wonderful name. Um, so that's where I kind of first discovered, and I'd already been coding for quite some time and doing 3D renders and writing my own generative code and processing and open frameworks and things. But this was where I really found out about the possibilities of using neural networks um, for art and, and some of the philosophical implications. Bye. So the first concept which really excited me as an artist is this idea of a latent space. So it's how can we conceptualize everything that a neural network has learned in spatial terms, right? And this is a really, really beautiful concept and actually applies to most of machine learning. Um, so in machine learning, it's not, this kind of image looks like maybe a 3D space, but it's not. It's actually a multi-dimensional space. Let's say 512 dimensions and you can move through and around these dimensions. So let's say that we've trained a neural network to make sense of a million different images of birds and categorize those birds and understand the different species of birds, different birds with different colors, different feathers, different backgrounds, right? But all of these things have something in common. There's a commonality of birdiness, <laughs> the essence of bird, and it's learned that thing. So what it does is it will scan across these images and it will start to plot them. So this whole data set, this training process is effectively a process of assigning all the images a certain number and a point in space, a coordinate in a latent space. Now, if we've trained it on a data set of, I don't know, all these different birds, maybe different species of birds will appear as different groupings in this space. So we'll say, okay, all of the sparrows are over here and all of the parakeets are over here, all of the hawks are down here. Now this is a machine learning algorithm and neural network is learning to do this and to differentiate between pixel data and learn how these are different species and how to categorize them and how to group them in space, right? So this is a really beautiful concept. And 
what you can then do from this space, and again, it might be also a facial recognition algorithm, right? It might be plotting human faces. So all of the female faces and all of the male faces are kind of there and there, but there's an in-between space as well, or like age, or like how big your nose is. That might be kind of one dimension is like where your nose is. So you can kind of imagine all of these groupings. Um, for an AI, a lot of AIs are used to classify, right? So if you say, okay, here are all pictures of dogs and cats, it will do something where it will create a latent space of everything it has learned from the data that you've given it. And it will kind of make two kind of groupings. And then that is effectively the machine learning saying all of the cats exist over here and all of the dogs exist over here. So then when you give it a new image, it will say, okay, that image exists here in my latent space. So that's probably an image of a dog, <laughs> right? So that's kind of a quick example of how these machine learning algorithms work. You can also think about latent spaces when it comes to language or sound, but I'll get onto that in a sec. Um, so when you've got this multi-dimensional latent space of all these images, a data set that you've trained it on, could be thousands and thousands and thousands of images, millions of images. What you can then do is you can compress those 512 mathematical dimensions into just two dimensions or three dimensions, which is a lovely thing that we can do called a TSNI. Um, and it allows you to visualize what's in a data set. So here is a TSNI of a commonly used data set called ImageNet. I think this is a small section of it. It's actually 14 million images. And you can kind of see in the top right, there's pictures of like boats and beaches, I think you kind of, I think you've got like golfers below that, and then you sort of seem to have camels and things below that. I know, sorry, if, if you can't quite see it, um, it'd be nice for me to zoom in, but I'm not quite sure. I need to enable that in my settings. Sorry, I haven't done that. Um, but you can you can look it up, T-S-N-E, T-S-N-E. Um, here is a T-S-N-E of Ikea's catalogue. <laughs> which makes me laugh. So here we go. You've got like all the office chairs kind of in the middle left and you've got um, rugs on the right, I don't know, bins top right, uh, lamps top left. So this is kind of a way of like saying, okay, so we've kind of understood what all these images have in common. It doesn't understand the context of these images. It doesn't understand anything about where these images come from. All it understands is what these images look like. What visual similarities do they have? And how can I plot them close to each other to try and understand these images, right? So there's IKEA. Um, this is quite a fun little experiment. So this here is, um, let's see if this works. It's just loading. So this is a, um, a little experiment called Freefall. Um, which effectively allows you to visualize um, 600 museum collections. It's a Google Chrome experiment um, as a TSNI in three dimensions. So here we go. We can kind of like move through this space <laughs> of like what the AI has learned that all of these things have in common. So, okay. You can kind of see like it's plotted things that it understands as similar, close to things that it understands as, as having something in common visually. Um, there's also a lovely experiment here, which is actually um, a little experiment also on Google Chrome experiments by Mario Klingerman, um, who's a friend of mine and a very um, prominent AI kind of machine learning art person. Um, and it's a lovely, lovely concept. So it's basically, you can, again, from these museums, take two images. So let's say this Hokusai uh, and a Mondria, and it will take us on a path in this multi-dimensional latent space <laughs> and it will say okay so this is where the Hokusai exists and this is where the Mondrian exists so let's kind of go on a journey from getting from one image to the other um so here we go that's kind of yeah a little fun thing that's called x degrees of separation you can kind of experiment with that yourself um so okay we can use it to explore existing data sets of museum collections let's say um, we can also think about this with language, which is an extraordinary concept. So actually, I'll come back to this slide. I'll quickly show you. Here we go. So um, projectortensorflow.org, um, this is plotting, I think, 10K, so 10,000 words of the English language. Um, and it, it does the same things. So it's plotting them in a space. Um, and it's basically given each one a multi-dimensional coordinate, although this has compressed it to three dimensions. Um, so we can say, okay, so where does the word, I don't know, uh, would be an interesting word to do it on, leader. So the word leader, okay, leader, leadership, politician, chairman. So these are all the words that kind of have things in common uh, with that single word. 
And this data set was effectively a scraped corpus taken from every, the corpus of the internet effectively. And the way they did that is they scraped Reddit for every external link to every web page that it came from. And they looked at where words were used. And then the machine learning algorithm starts to understand how words are used in common and what they probably mean. So it's basically learning the actual semantic and contextual meaning of a word and reducing it to a point in a mathematical space. <laughs> which is just like such a beautiful bizarre concept so this is a little artwork that i haven't really done anything with yet but I, i'll probably um at some point put this engrave it into a piece of stone or something um like the rosetta stone like this is the uh coordinate for the word human so this is where a machine learning network trained on the english language has understood the word human to exist and these are the 512 numbers where that word exists um, there's an article Memo Acton as well, who um, did some lovely projects, um, taking these words, these embeddings of these words and saying, okay, so if we've got the word human and we take away <laughs> the mathematical point of the word God, so you can do that, you can do like arithmetic in this space, then we are left with uh, this point here. And this point here corresponds to the word animal. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Science plus God equals metaphysics. So like you can do kind of these mathematical equations using language to explore this latent space. Um, I think you can look, look up um, words of math bias and word of math. That was the um, Twitter account. Um, word of math bias was quite fun because it arbitrarily generated the word um, man to a, a word and then the word woman to the synonyms that would come up for that word and then it would do the word woman for the original word and the word man to the synonyms that would come up and it kind of showed you bias in language um, but it was kind of a double bias because it was also like the original word was programmed in so it couldn't come up and obviously these systems aren't biased like they're, they're not biased like we are biased like the way that we use language that's what it's reflecting back at us uh, so that's also an important point but obviously the developers can work to try and circumnavigate that but most developers aren't generally coming from a social science background or necessarily thinking about the social implications of the systems that they are building um so okay um moving on a bit so we've got this concept of a uh convolutional neural network <laughs> sorry if it's getting a bit technical for some but this is effectively how we start to understand images. And this is a really complex problem for a computer, right? How does a computer, uh, a cold, sterile counting machine, contemplate and understand that this is, I don't know, a, an image of a water bottle from this angle and this angle and this angle and on a different background and with a different water bottle and a different design. So how does it understand all these things to have something in common? And that's something that, you know, us as humans do incredibly well. Um, in the same way that we have, you know, a huge part of our brain for facial recognition. Again, these are really hard tasks for a computer. Like computers can do amazing arithmetic, but for this sort of thing, you know, this is actually quite an old algorithm, but only recently have we seen the development of GPUs um, for effectively military and for game industry and actually for the pornography industry as well and for Bitcoin mining. All of these things have, you know, sped up the development of GPUs. And GPUs are brilliant at this sort of mathematics, because unlike a CPU, um, a normal processor in a computer where it's, you know, going through and making a series of calculations, a GPU can calculate all of those things at once. So like all of the pixels on your screen, it can make that calculation at once. So that's why it's very good for a neural net. So effectively, a ConvNet works very well with a GPU. And what it does is it scrolls across these images, tries to make sense of them, and it will basically look at a pixel image and it will basically do weights across that and then it will kind of create a new version of that image <laughs> which it will then start to look for more and more abstract features in so it will start looking for edges and circles and kind of in a similar way to how the human eye understands the world funnily enough and you know neural networks are being used to understand how our brains understand and conceive the world um, but you know after a few different layers it will have reduced that image to some weird pixel data, a whole bunch of dimensions, and it will start to see eyes. And then eventually it will start to see whole faces. And then that's when it has understood kind of what these images have in common and on a really low abstract level. Um, 
what what it then does yeah is it plots these in this latent space so that's what i'm saying so if you pass an image through a convnet and you're passing a million images each of them will have a different 512 numbers which is the convnet understanding that image and it will have a point in space now the other concept so this is the end of my theory bit i'm nearly done <laughs> um but the other concept which really excited me was this idea of a gan i don't know if people have heard of gans um basically a generative adversarial network the idea is this is kind of a precursor to a deep fake. This is how you create a fake new image that could have been in the original data set, but wasn't in the original data set. So this is this image, this idea of again, um, you basically the discriminator on the right. And again, I find the language fascinating here. It's like adversarial. Why is it adversarial? In a way, this is like a sort of collaborative system. I don't know why they're kind of calling it a battle. Um, also this idea of a discriminator. I mean, you know, I talk a lot on queer theory as well. So this whole idea of discriminating, you know, it feels so loaded, the language that scientists are kind of assigning to these systems. So it's like literally discriminating whether this is a real image of a face or not. And it's like, there's something quite problematic in that. And of course, this whole idea of images passing for real as well, that's very embedded in queer theory, like this whole idea in the Turing test of can we get a computer to pass for a human? And of course, Turing being a gay man, it kind of makes sense that he would have come up with a whole thought experiment around the concept of passing. Um, so this is a system all about creating fake images to pass as real images, right? Uh, it was kind of create, it was conceived by Ian Goodfellow, a Canadian um, machine learning scientist. Um, I think back in 2014, so fairly, fairly recently. And the idea is you start, so you pair these two networks to work together. Um, first one is the classifier. So that's kind of what I was explaining before about you know, understanding these latent spaces in a convnet looking through images. And you pair it with another neural network, which tries to generate images from scratch, from pixel data, from noise, right? And it will iterate and get better and better and better. And it will be given a score and saying, this looks like 50% of an image that could have been in my original data set, you know, get better. And then that is the machine learning. It improves itself at creating an image that could trick the network for learning what images look like into thinking that's a new image. But it's not an image that was in the original data set. It's a new image that has been conceived and imagined. Again, I'm getting a bit human, <laughs> humanizing here, but you know, effectively dreamt up by the neural network. Um, so here are some images. This is actually back in 2018. They've got even higher quality now and, and more amazing, but here are some faked images from a GAN, um, a, a GAN called Big GAN. There was another one called Style GAN, which was a sort of standard system. And I mean, that is kind of extraordinary, right? So that's an image of a bubble that never existed, but it's kind of learnt what bubbles look like through millions of images. But the way that it's kind of learnt the light, and I mean, it's learnt unbelievable low level abstract features about what images of bubbles look like and being able to recreate that. I mean, that's really extraordinary. Um, Anyway, I'm going to move on a little bit. So now I'm getting into my own work around this field, kind of having given you the whole amble of all the theory side. And the reason that I like to talk about the theory side is because I think it's important for artists not to add to the fear mongering, to actually try and demystify and you know, deconstruct kind of what these processes are doing and try and get more people from different backgrounds. And that's why I do talks like this. It's trying to encourage more people to get into this area. Um, and I can point you in some directions, some good resources as well, if you want to try some of these processes yourself. There's a program called Runway ML that I'd recommend people look up. So you don't need so much programming knowledge, but it has a lot of these AI systems built into it. Um, there's also, yeah, AIartist.org, which shows a few what different artists are kind of doing with these technologies at the moment. Um, and Machine Learning for Artists, Gene Cogan's program as well. So, yeah. Onto the first piece. So this was kind of the first piece that I created with a generator network, right? And it was a reference to this wonderfully famous seminal piece of video arts, Namjoon Pike's TV Buddha. This is the Buddha looking at a CCTV feed, showing a kind of feedback loop of the Buddha. So it's kind of the Buddha looking at itself, but mediated through technology, right? So my idea with collaborator in Berlin, Roland Arnold, was what if we could create an AI to create an image of the Buddha and have the Buddha looking at a really early <laughs> AI, a really, really early machine learning network, uh, trying to create an image of the Buddha. So this is what happened. This was our machine learning Buddha, uh, auto-encoded Buddha, um, 2016. 
So this is the Buddha looking at an AI trying to create the essence of the Buddha, right? But this is what the AI created, what the neural network created. It, it couldn't create the images. And that's really interesting because these this is a failure, right? But as an artist, for me, I get so excited when these things fail because for me, it points out the limitations in them. It shows the kind of guts, the inner working. It's a way of actually demystifying this process. Like, okay, it's kind of failed. Why has it failed? Well, first off, as artists, we you know didn't have enough images of Buddha. I think we trained on 8,000 images of Buddha. That wasn't enough. Um, also, we didn't have powerful enough technology because back then it wasn't very accessible or easy to run this code and get it working on powerful enough machines. So it's kind of created this, you know, guts of this neural network failing to create a representation, which for us was a really beautiful poet, like poetic move. Um, so that was kind of yeah our first failed experiment, if you like, um, of of a Buddha being generated. So one of my other early pieces, and this is um, recently been shown actually in City of London. Um, this is a large LED screen, kind of mounted. Um, and, and this is a piece called Latent Space. So again, this is an AI kind of in its infancy. So it's an AI a machine learning algorithm. I'm saying AI so often, sorry, I said I wouldn't do that. <laughs> it's easier to say, um, but this is a earlier um, generator network that had been trained on ImageNet, 14 million images. And, and it really generated quite low quality images from, from what it had learned, because it was, again, sort of really primitive, um, early kind of precursor to what we have now, the hyper-realistic deep fakes, right? So this is, this is the piece, this is called latent space. And effectively what these are, is these are points in the latent space, and it's just going on a walk, a randomized journey through this space. Now this neural network um, was called Synth Synthesizing. It's by um, University of Wyoming's Evolving AI Lab. Um, and again, appropriation of code. You know, I'm, I'm very aware that I'm not writing all this code myself, but I kind of hack on top of it. So try and get it to do things that I find philosophically poetic, interesting or critical um, and, and work with these technologies. So this is an AI trained on, yeah, 14 million photographs. It's going on a journey through, but instead of me telling it to try and create a new realistic image of something in the ImageNet data set, everything is in the ImageNet data set, images of toilet seats, images of cats, dogs, you know, you name it, people, it's actually the politics is very interesting. So um, Kate Crawford wrote a paper called Excavating AI, which kind of looks at, um, and, and I did a project with Trevor Paglin as well, where they looked at some of the more controversial human labels that have been ascribed to images in this standardized data set used by universities and by industry and it's got things like heroin addicts in it I mean it's got the word terrorists in it. it's like what does a terrorist look like I mean that's quite dark and loaded um, but anyway this is stripped of all of its meaning and instead of generating a realistic image of an apple or a bird I am generating I'm just moving through the space before it has time to settle on anything and what it's learned is it's learned kind of the essence of how us as humans take photographs so it's learned the rule of thirds and it's learned horizons and it's learned these kind of blocks of color and what look like abstract expressionist paintings and you know it does make us challenge well what are we doing when we're creating abstract paintings like are we effectively kind of yeah using what we've learned, our sensory data, in the same way that a machine learning network can. And is there really anything so special about our brain? I, I don't know. I mean, obviously there is. Obviously there's intentionality. There is no agency or intentionality behind this network. I, as the artist, have created this piece. <laughs> but there is this kind of black box thing going on where it can learn from millions of images. And I don't really understand how it's made those connections and how it's creating those weights to understand these images. Um, Anyway, so that was one of the early pieces. This is another piece from a similar time called Closed Loop. Um, so this is an installation, I think, in, um, in Shanghai and in Beijing. Um, and it's basically yeah, projected on these two pieces of perspex. And it's two different systems. So one for creating images, um, given a sentence, right? And the other one, which looks at images and writes a sentence. And I've pitched them against each other. So they're in this back and forth feedback loop, right? So here we go. OK, so in this image, it sees a large piece of paper. So now it's feeding that into the other network. And it's saying, create us an image of a large piece of paper. So now it's creating an image here of a large piece of paper. Um, 
wonder if I can skip it through actually, see what else it comes up with. What's interesting to me though, this piece is that it gets stuck in all of these different places. It, it often sees animals, birds, cats, and it's kind of the limitation again of this latent space. It's kind of moving through it and, and you know, pitching these different networks against each other. It's, it's reading into itself. And because this is quite a primitive network, which wasn't able to create a hyper-realistic image of a bird flying in the air, it, it allows itself to go off in, on, tangent, on tangents, on kind of, you know, misinterpret itself and constantly going. Um, so I, I effectively, I just leave this piece to generate. Um, it shows in museums as a sort of three hour video loop because actually as an artist, it's quite difficult to get a GPU running this live. Um, but in a way, what is live? <laughs> because I have kind of set the timing for this piece anyway, it's already a human construct, right? So I see this as kind of a performance which took place inside of a computer, but in a way it can be, you know, played back um, and exhibited as, as a video piece. So here we go, bird with a red beak. I mean, we can all see that. Now it sees a man's head. <laughs> um, so there we go. Um, so, okay, how much time have I got? I probably ought to whiz through this last couple of projects. Um, okay, yeah, we're nearly on to my latest project. So this piece here was quite a fun commission. Um, and, and it was basically, it's called Cusp. And these are all birds that have been generated by a general travel serial network, trained on images of birds from the Essex marshes, um, from an estuary, from a marshland, mudflats, kind of this, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a space which is a bird sanctuary and it's a space which I've been going to since I was a child, so I have a personal connection there. And in a way, what I wanted to do was go in, out into this like ancient landscape, so full of life, and organisms and plant a screen literally in the mud. So here I am going out into this mud um, where you can see some of the birds behind me on the top right image and, and plant this projection screen into the mud and project these machine learning generated birds across the marsh in visual dialogue with the real birds behind them. All the sounds in this piece as well are generated using machine learning um, from 10 hours of field recording from the Essex marshlands. Um, so here we go, here are some wading birds. So yeah, that piece is showing um, at the ZKM at the moment, which is really exciting, and in Shanghai, the AII Art Center. <laughs> um, but it's, again, it's like this, yeah, you see the movement of these birds, right? And, and that is, again, the, the way you get that, and you might have seen that in quite a few videos where people are working with these sorts of processes, with these generator networks. And effectively, it's, it's what's called interpolation. So you're moving through this latent space and, and the features and things are changing. So you'll see the beaks kind of extending, but that might be one of these dimensions that correspond to the beak. If you stretch it that way, maybe the beak will change. <laughs> um, so you can do extraordinary things with these with these processes. What I love though as well is that, you know, how it has conceived of the bird in profile. And that really intrigues me because there is something about that, which, you know, my data set that I gathered, I scraped from the internet, from open source images of people taking images of the birds. Um, and these birds were, you know, in all different shapes and, and different perspectives um, and pointing in different directions, but, you know, as we did as cavemen to conceive the natural world, 
you know, in painting elephants on the wall of the cave in profile. It's interesting to me that an AI machine learning algorithm has found it a lot easier to create images of a bird in profile. Um, so anyway, this this is, yeah, so this actually showed in the Natural History Museum in Berlin, which is quite fun, kind of surrounding it with, with birds. Um, okay, so moving on a little bit from, from, from birds and abstraction and latent spaces, um, there is this more sinister side, which I'm sure we're all aware of, of using machine learning algorithms um, for fake news, for rewriting history. So here is obviously this famous image of, of the Great Depression. It's like, actually, what if we kind of made this, you know, a completely different scene and rewrote history? Um, you know, of course, with deep fakes, they're being used all the time to kind of control politicians' faces and, you know, also as just a funny app on all your Instagram. And, you know, obviously, I think for the first time now, there's um, the, the EU are, are writing policy around uh, governing and banning the use of deep fake technology for creating fake news. Um, but yeah, of course, it has huge potentials. And, you know, often it's being used to create images of people in power. Um, and it's being used to exploit people as well and oppress people. So the Indian government, you know, have used this technique against um, women rights activists to create kind of images to blackmail them with. Um, and of course, yeah, deep fake pornography as well. Um, so yeah, it's got a much darker side. Um, so anyway, I kind of, you know, I wanted to explore that, but actually where I was coming from in a way was also looking at representation, right? So these standardized models, <clears throat> this is a, a standard data set um, called, there are, there are a couple for, for training facial recognition systems. So this one was, um, FFHQ, I think it's images gathered from Flickr, but of course Flickr is an American company with mostly American users. So there is this kind of whole thing of like, you know, mostly these are sort of tourist photos of people from other, you know, uh, marginalized communities. It's not necessarily those people who are going to be uploading them into the data set. Uh, there's also one called Celebe HQ, which is even less diverse because that's literally American celebrities. And, um, you know, that is what we kind of used as our model for training the image of the human face um, and, you know, kind of used for like the beauty vector, <laughs> which is this mad concept that I don't know if anyone saw that, the Facetune app on your, what was it called? The Face app, it's called. And you can like make yourself older and younger. And at one point you can make yourself more beautiful. And black faces came up as lighter skinned faces when you said, make me more beautiful. And that's completely ridiculous. But obviously that is a reflection on society, but it's also the responsibility of the developers who didn't notice that that was happening um, because, you know, they're trained on a beauty vector, which corresponded to a whole bunch of models, which I guess meant that there were more, more white models in their data set. So it's like, you know, it's a complete reflection of us. And we've always got to be aware of these things when using it. But anyway, this, these are all fake faces. Uh, generated faces from, from this network of 70,000 faces, uh, not showing a huge amount of diversity. I was interested in working with the queer community. So in London, I'm very much part of the drag and queer community as well. Thinking about, you know, queerness, otherness, how that often isn't represented in these systems, right? So the idea for this project was effectively to take this standardized data set and inject it with a thousand images, only took a thousand <laughs> uh, from this 70,000, basically inject it with a thousand images of drag kings and drag queens and drag things and non-binary gender fluid identities, right? And see what it did to this network. And what it did was it shifted all of the weights in this neural network from a point of heteronormativity and kind of homogene homogeneity into this space of otherness and queerness. And this piece is called querying the data set, right? So it goes from these images to these images. And this is a literal back and forth. These are the same points in space uh, with the first model and then after it had been introduced to drag, <laughs> right? So from there, I then create videos where I can move through this space again. So here is a uh, kind of moving through my, my drag space. <laughs> um, this is the starting point of the ZZ project. So ZZ, actually the name itself comes from um, 
Z, the, the non-gendered pronoun, um, and also the Z vector, which is a scientific term for how you interface with an artificial intelligence and move through this space. Um, so ZZ and ZZ also, as you're probably quite aware, is French for Willy, um, which is kind of <laughs> also just fun and camp. <laughs> um, so here we go and you can see it. Yeah, it's moving through this space. So I show these as um, LED screens, which I get custom built. Um, they're like part of a festival screen effectively. I build them in China and, um, and, and yeah, try and do it ethically through, through good, through good suppliers. Um, and we are building them for exhibitions at the moment. Um, so ZZ also has their own Instagram page, ZZ Drag. Um, some of the earlier images, they all had captions also generated from a text generator trained on captions of drag performers. Um, so moving from there, I guess the next stage for me was like, okay, this is using a generative adversarial network. This is using a generator network. I am playing with ideas of representation in standardized networks, effectively challenging and questioning kind of appropriated standard networks, right? Moving on from that, I wanted to think, how can I actually incorporate the drag performers, the performing community into these, into this artwork effectively? Uh, I wanted ZZ to be able to move, to have a voice. I mean, of course ZZ is moving here, but it's in a very controlled way. It's, you know, literally using mathematical coordinates. I can't get this to lip sync, <laughs> right? And that was my task. How do I get ZZ to lip sync? So, and again, the representation was very important to us. We didn't, we wanted to move beyond a sort of normative idea as well of what drag is, because in the London drag scene, you know, quite different to uh, maybe RuPaul's Drag Race, where it tends to be more cis gay men dressing as drag queens. Like, you know, obviously we have kings, we have drag things, we have such a wider, more expansive um, side to drag of people effectively challenging society's notions around gender but in a really fun entertaining performance yeah. form um, so that's why it's such a great way to just challenge ai and it's so accessible as well and you know people love drag and want to engage with it so moving on from there yeah how do we get zz to lip sync so this was one of my first experiments this is using um a data set from the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, one of the oldest drag venues in London, um, bar whatever, it's a very diverse group. And this is a really early experiment. And effectively yeah, I'm using um, video from um, the ballroom scene from, from Vogue and effectively creating drag. I mean, again, the politics of this is, is challenging. So this video I haven't really shown so much because actually the project then became so much more about whose bodies are we using and who can control that body and what's the ethics in that, right? But this is one of the very earliest experiments um, of kind of ZZ. So you can see here, here's ZZ kind of moving through. And I love this because, you know, the faces of the crowd also all got generated as drag creatures and things. And for me, it's like sort of Velasquez painting. There's something so beautiful and painterly about it. Um, so moving on from that, I'm actually not gonna show this video right now. I think you can watch this video yourself, um, but I'm gonna talk briefly about um, how we went about creating are deep fake bodies for the ZZ project. So effectively, yeah, moving beyond our screens, the uh, the moving between around these data sets, we wanted to start to create a performance with them. So I linked up with my main collaborator um, in London. She's called Me the Drag Queen, very confusing name. Um, but Me is one of the London's top drag performers. She's mentored over a hundred performers in London and has a large, drag family um, and was able to help me cast this project to make sure that we had real diversity, but also to think through what could we say? <laughs> How, you know, there's so much you can explore, like an AI performing as a drag performer, like we can get it to perform all sorts of different songs, maybe talking about AI's relationship with society, right? About an AI taking over all of our jobs, but of course it's not gonna take over all of our jobs. And, you know, my job as the artist was like, how can we create this humanoid, 
figure when the thing I am most against is this idea of a Terminator AI where it's kind of anthropomorphized. Like, how can we create these drag characters and bodies, but at the same time deconstruct them? And there's something really fun here, right, as well, is that drag is a constructed identity. We are constructing a deep fake version of them. And then through our project, we are trying to deconstruct that whole notion. So anyway, this is how we created our deep fake characters. So it starts by creating our data set. And our data set was effectively going into uh, the apple tree, which is a drag venue, which was closed between the lockdowns. And we were able to go and do a shoot socially distanced and effectively film our drag performers in a room for about three minutes in full drag, literally moving moving their bodies, moving around, showing different perspective, different angles. Then we turn all of these into a photographic a, a, a image data set. What we then do, which is a little bit different from how the generator I explained at the beginning works, um, this is called a conditional GAN. So you basically have to condition it on something. And what we did is we condition it on a skeleton. So we turn all of these videos that we've created, and this is Lily Snatch Dragon, she's an amazing um, AFAB female drag performer, um, drag queen, and also one of the, I think she's like the top, she's one of the top burlesque performers in the world. Um, she's often voted very highly, she's a fantastic performer. And um, this is her moving around and we've turned her into a skeleton. And again, there's a whole politics in like reducing a body to a skeleton. Um, you know, a few of my dance friends said like these sorts of dance analysis, like looking like Laban kind of, actually there's something quite dodgy that needs to be sort of investigated there as well. But anyway, for the sake of this, yeah, we turned it into, we reduced it to um, 69 point skeleton. And then what we can effectively do is the machine learning process comes in. So what we are saying is to a neural network, take in these images of skeletons, so we're removing the body, all you get to see is this skeleton, right? And then try and create me an image. And I will give you a score on how close that image you've created is from that skeleton, how close it is to the original image, which you can't see. Right. So again, that's kind of like a generative adversarial network, but it's conditioned on a skeleton rather than starting with random noise. We're starting with a skeleton. And this is what it does. So starting left, it's kind of this is, you know, Lily, very basic after maybe about an hour of training on the computer at the end of my bed. Um, this is like, yeah, a thousand iterations, let's say. And then at the top, at the right, that's after 10,000 iterations. And it's starting to look very close to the original image. So once we've got that, we can then turn any new skeleton into a realistic image of Lily Snatch Dragon. And this is the magic of a deep fake, right? This is the conceit. So here we go. On the left, we have me, the drag queen, performing as Lily Snatch Dragon. She's able to do the movement, control the mouth, creates a whole body, right? <laughs> we actually um, filmed 13 drag performers. Lily wasn't the only one. And we filmed them all close up and full length. So here is close up. We wanted to do close up to really get the detail in the performance and the lip sync performance that we'll be doing. So like I said, we, we, we created data sets for 13 performers, but a fun thing we were able to do with that was we were able to create an amalgamation. So effectively, if we treated all of the videos of all of our performers as one data set, <laughs> then the deep fake would get confused and not do something that deep fake is supposed to do. Because obviously the engineers have created a deep fake to kind of create the most realistic image of the body that you're feeding in. But what happens if we feed in 13 different bodies, right? And for us, this is another level of querying. It's, it's confusing the system dirtying the system. And there's a whole thing in, you know, techno activism as well of like dirtying systems, using them for purposes they're not meant to be used for. And it's kind of a queer tactic as well, isn't it? It's like, you know, let's take something that's meant to be used to oppress and control us and sprinkle it with glitter um, and do something completely ridiculous with it and, you know, really enjoy the failure as well. In, you know, there's the queer art of failure, how Stan writes about. Um, <clears throat> so these are some of our ZZ, characters are kind of amalgamations. I'm going to play you a short little clip of our amalgamation performing to you, um, David Bowie. Here we go.
There we go. Um, so if that was also a bit choppy on, on your Zoom, then um, you can watch this online. I'll show you the link in a second. Um, quickly, as the very last thing, I just want to also explain where this project is going next. Um, so we kind of created this project with 13 drag performers, which is a web app, which you can all go and play with. I'll give you the link in a second. But alongside this, another thing that we wanted to do was think about how could we actually bring this performing drag performer to stage? to actually really give them a physical presence. And I thought a wonderful thing to do would be um, to basically create duets, musical theater duets between the real life drag performer and then their deep fake doppelganger clone, <laughs> right? And see the times that it fails and it breaks down and really enjoy those and take our time with it. And like really think about what can AI bring to performance? to the form of performance, right? And this was a whole research project in Edinburgh, which I was doing as well, which was basically asking the question of what can AI teach drag performance and what can drag performance teach AI, <laughs> right? So here we go. This is Zizi and me. Right now, I am actually planning to take this to stage for a festival. We haven't done too many actual live performances yet, but this is a little video clip of kind of the concept, if you like. Um, and they're performing anything you can do, I can do better, which for me was just kind of said it all about our relationship with AI. <laughs> so here we go. Brat. Any note you can sing, I can sing higher. I can sing any note higher than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. 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 How do you sing that high? I'm a girl. Anything you can say, I can say softer. I can say anything softer than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Here we go. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, you can watch all of these things on my website, jkelwis.com. Um, but also, yeah, everyone should go and have a play with the web app itself. So, uh, zz.ai. And the idea, I guess, here is that we've created this kind of pick your own cabaret. And whilst these people are performing to you, you can change the body. And I guess in a way, what we're trying to hope to do here is like, we actually paid our models. That never happens. We paid for our data sets, right? Through lockdown, we were able to give some paid work, some drag performers, which was lovely in itself, but also thinking about the ethics of who's controlling who, because that's very often not questioned. So deep fakes, it's exploitative, right? If it's done without consent, then it's, it's dark and it's oppressive. So, you know, this whole project was about like, they all know each other, they're all a community, and they all consent to how their bodies are going to be manipulated by people within their community. So actually, someone else coming along and controlling uh, Eda Pussy Rex's movement, we decided would not be appropriate. Like we're gonna keep this as a closed system in our website. Um, we're gonna take it to the VNA. We've taken it to quite a few different um, galleries around now. Um, but yeah, do go and have a play. It's really fun to play with. I'd suggest like zooming in on things. I think um, there's like Caramel, I like for me, I love the moments where it fails. So there's Sweet Dreams by Beyonce, a wonderful performer Caramel did, you know, drop down into the splits in that. But the AI had not seen most of our drag performers fall into the splits in their data sets. So it doesn't know what to do. So if you watch, you know, Mark Anthony or me, the drag queen or Lily Snatch Dragon trying to do Caramel's movement, they literally dissolve into the floor. <laughs> like their wig like takes off as a balloon. And it's just, you know, it's wonderful and bizarre. And it's for me, those failures which give it real character. Anyway, there we go. I'm going to stop talking now and pass over to answer some questions, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That's amazing. I don't know, Michael, did you want to um, start this off? Um, well, thank you, Jake. I mean, I think that was that was remarkable. I mean, I appreciated all of the 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 sort of theory at the front end. It was great to hear you speak to that, particularly from the perspective of your practice and the kinds of things you're trying to achieve. And then wonderful to sort of see, um, all of that applied in such different contexts. I mean, in a way, I think it's kind of remarkable that we're, you know, at one moment we're on the beach, uh, sort of watching these birds. And it was interesting to sort of to see you situate uh, uh, the network in, um, 
in situ, if you will, or in a real space. So it's in a way I thought was kind of interesting there as you take us out of the screen and back into the world, if you will, or reinsert the uh, the AI into the world, which I thought was pretty fascinating. And of course, from there, we moved to the to vaudeville uh, and 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 to the stage and, and the drag queens. And I guess I, I don't necessarily have a question yet, but what I'm thinking about and what I really love about watching the images is what you were describing, those moments when the GAN fails, so to speak, um, and creates these moments that on the one hand are quite painterly. Um, at times, uh, uh, I, I want to use the word grotesque. I mean, there's a moment when sometimes I'm thinking a little bit Francis Bacon in mm -hmm. terms of some of the way things get smeared and um, sort of a, across the, the, the our, our visual field, if you will. Um, and I mean, I, I can imagine you just kind of getting lost in all of that sometimes in sort of just thinking about and, and sort of watching these effects as they unroll sort of one after the other. But um, so I, I, I mean, I, maybe, you know, could you speak a little bit to uh, the pleasure you might derive from sort of watching the machine struggle from <laughs> sort of moving yeah. from that realistic place to this more abstract place and then back again? Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I think, yeah, to, to answer also to talk on what you were just saying about mm -hmm. this, you know, taking it out to the marsh and taking it to the stitch, I think that is actually a large part of my practice. It's how do we reframe mm -hmm and recontextualize deep learning, machine learning models, because, you know, it's so hard to visualize these models. They are mm -hmm. generally kind of mathematical data systems which are uploaded to the cloud. And it's very hard. That's why we want to ascribe narrative and understand them. So actually ways of visualizing them or like, you know, planting it in nature or planting it on the stage or like taking it into different contexts. I think that's an interesting way for me to kind of push our way of thinking how this permeates every aspect of our lives as well. Um, but also kind of finding really interesting, fun ways of reframing it in ways you wouldn't necessarily expect to see. Um, I think, yeah, what you were saying about the kind of the way that these images flow in and out of abstraction, absolutely, that, that is kind of my favorite thing mm -hmm. about you working with AI and machine learning. And in a way, what that is, is it's this sense of emergence of seeing something come out of a black box system that you as the artist can't really predict or wouldn't have anticipated. And, you know, there's nothing new about that. It kind of sounds big and new and scary because it's AI, but it's like, no, like actually, you know, media artists have been experimenting with randomness for a very, very long time. Like, you know, you can kind of go back to, I don't know, John Cage or, or Julian, Dub, Julian, Dub, Julian Dub, Julian Dubashur or like so many artists kind of have created uh, sort of structures like rolling a dice, like using randomness, using emergence. So, you know, this is, again, an extension of that. It's a, it's a tool, but it's a tool which does do some kind of black box magic stuff where it's even harder to predict where it's coming from. And it does have this sense of intelligence. It doesn't have a sense of, you know, I, I, I'd say... It's so hard as well because, you know, the language can be disputed so much and people talk about, you know, when we're talking about the language. But I, I would say that, you know, Searle says that a stream going down, you know, a, a, a water stream can have a form of intelligence. So I'd definitely say this is a form of intelligence, but I wouldn't say that it has any agency or intentionality um, as of yet in the way that the human creator does have. Um, but, it, 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 you know, it does do something truly... Uh, random or oh, I've, I've lost the word now there are too many words in my head anyway <laughs> you get what I'm saying but for me seeing kind of the weird th ways it smears things it's like that's actually looking into the guts of the neural network that's when it really starts to abstract is starting to see something so not human and again there's also like this activist thing of like that is breaking the system as well it's no longer able to create a realistic representation of the human face because I've given it such weird images that it didn't really comprehend so that is like literally a way of like dirtying the the system it's like i've literally kind of broken the system by giving it queerness and otherness and that also beckons the question do we want to be represented in these systems do we want to be recognized that that's a whole other field right it's like right yeah sure maybe sometimes we need to be re recognized but it's like depends who's trying to do the recognizing who's owning that data who's trying to colonize queerness it's like sometimes you don't want to be recognized and yeah no, no, that, that's great. That's great. You know, when you were talking about sort of intentionality in those moments when we think 
we see intentionality. It, it reminded me briefly of sometimes when you're, you know, you, you walk into a space with an interactive system and you do something and then something happens and you're suddenly going, wait a second. Uh, th there's just that moment where you feel recognized just for a fraction of a second. You think, wait, did the system just see me do that and respond? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, anyway, I, I'm sort of imagining there must be moments where suddenly you're thinking, wait, was that an intentional moment or are we still just in this kind of random accidental space where it looks right. intentional, but anyway. And as these systems get better, there will be less of those accidental failed moments. And for me, that, right. that is what I really love. Anyway, um, does Roberta have a question? I'm kind of half reading yes. the question. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, she does. There's, it's quite there quite in the chat. Read. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask Kwame if he could just, um, if he's monitoring the chat, maybe he can just read that, share that question. Oh, this us. is Roberta. She, you're just there, right? Would you like to ask yourself? Oh, Roberta can do that too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Great. There you are. Hi, um, Roberta. And, uh, yeah, maybe, hi. <laughs> and maybe I didn't explain myself. Well, now that I'm reading it, it, you know, like trying to listen and to, and to, yeah, no, right, I just at find the same it time, I'm not very good it. multitasker, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, like, um, when I, when I was uh, uh, watching your work, I, I, I was thinking about, um, actually some of my students might, might be tuned in on YouTube, but, uh, so I was thinking about, um, all of my engineering students and the fact that every single time I show them some artsy stuff, um, um, they're really puzzled by it, by the, by the very different approach that uh, um, the artist is taking. And I was really taken by your experiment, or at least this is, this is what they would um, um, uh, qualify as an experiment. And I'm wondering if you, if like, if you had any interaction with like straight engineers, not engineers who are working with artists, but engineers who are yeah, working yeah. with uh, machine learning and uh, that's all they do and that's all they're trained for. And what is your reaction? And if they have a pick up on uh, what you have discovered and like, I'm very fascinated by this type of dialogue. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so yeah, no, I have quite a few friends who are engineers. I mean, I went to traditional, traditional art school. So so kind of generally, my friends are artists, but having worked in this field for a while now, um, I have met a lot of engineers working on these technologies as well. Um, so yeah, I've got quite a few friends at, at Google DeepMind, um, or just DeepMind now. So those are their engineers really kind of pushing for the future of these technologies. I think the interesting thing in a way is that the sorts of engineers that I would maybe mix with and get to meet through the sorts of things that I'm doing tend to be the ones that are more interested in kind of the artistic applications or the social implications of these systems as well. Um, so generally, most of the people that I know are very actually focused on some of those sorts of questions and making sure that we, you know, are talking about algorithmic unfairness and bias and all of these sorts of questions. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I've had lots of really interesting conversations for sure with engineers. I haven't actually collaborated too many with too many of them. I think it's, um, you know, I, I've worked with programmers in developing a web app, um, but generally I, I tend to do machine learning code myself. Um, but yeah, also I've been part of a research project at the University of Edinburgh, and that's a department called Experiential AI, which crosses between the humanities and the engineering, but it's actually out of like the informatics department. So again, kind of talking to engineers about these processes and trying to sort of categorically understand it, but like understand like what we can say about AI, how we can do that. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I've had lots of interesting conversations. I do enjoy explaining how it all works and, you know, how I've understood it to work. But obviously, because I'm not sort of from an engineering background, I do that as an artist would. So I do really enjoy having those conversations for sure. But, you know, sometimes there is in those sorts of conversations a bit much of a focus on how was it made rather than necessarily why was it made. So did you find that uh, uh, they're having trouble understanding the concept or are they OK and they're like intrigued? Not generally, actually. I think I think most of my artworks, I try to like make the concept as simple as possible in a way, because machine learning is such a complex field to understand and unpick in the first place. So actually, what I then do with it, I try and make almost like one-liners, <laughs> like you can get it. I mean, I did one that was trained on explicit images, right? So I was actually trying to create the computers. I didn't show it here because I wasn't quite sure if it would be appropriate to be showing explicit images, but it's you know creating. Uh, Yahoo trying to, you know, censor images on their search engine and then getting that neural network to reverse engineer and create the most 
explicit images from scratch. So it's the computer's idea of what human anatomy and sexuality and pornography looks like. It's kind of extraordinary. But it's like, again, it's a very simple concept that most people get like, oh, okay, it's AI porn, <laughs> so you're fine. <laughs> or like AI birds or like AI drag. It's like, they're kind of, you know, they're one liners, but also I hope that there's a lot of depth there that you can kind of also unpick in an art sense, but also on a technical level. Um, but yeah, I think there was something else. I think that's a wonderful thing about being an artist though, because you said something interesting, which is like your experiments, right? Which obviously I would never think of them as my experiments. For me, they're my artworks, but you're right. As an engineer, that is probably kind of the way you're seeing it because you're iterating towards something which is functional or has purpose. And what's lovely as an artist is that you don't have to do that. <laughs> I don't have any responsibility or accountability to make something that works or functions. I can literally stand back and just laugh at when it doesn't work. And that is such a liberating thing about being an artist. That I'm not working for anyone. I'm not trying to prove that this thing can work or function in the best possible way or even has a purpose. So I can effectively be taking machine learning papers and models and finding ways of using them in ways that they were never intended to be used by the scientists um, and, you know, finding poetry in that. So there's there's something quite fun in that. So, yeah, it's just I guess it's a different mentality. Um, but actually, when I've taught scientists, it does just generally generally quite, you know, excited and engage them as well. But obviously, it's a very different way of, of working. <laughs> That's Jane, great. did you have a question? Should we go to Jane? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so amazing. So amazing. Um, I, I also agree. Um, I, I love the painterly qualities. I love a lot of the things that I actually echo very much, that a lot of things that Michael said. Uh, I wanted to get back to kind of what you were saying um, when you did respond to Michael about this idea, and you talked about it early on, about just this idea of AIs, they, they don't have the same agency and still this idea of intelligence and what is intelligence and just thinking a lot about um, non-human intelligence and what our responsibility is to the, the training and the development of non-human intelligence. And I was thinking we had, um, like I said, we we're doing an AI, uh, an AI series and we brought in an indigenous artist. Her name is Susan Kite. And she talked a lot about the responsibility that we have to the non-human other. And so that, of course, you know, can be nature or it can be what's now becoming AI. And um, I was just, and, you know, obviously we don't want to anthropomorphize because then we're reducing it to being something that's like humans, it has arms and legs, or it has feelings and thoughts, but it's still something that is developing. And I, I thought one of the things that I couldn't stop thinking about is that when you were showing that one piece um, about the, what did you call it, the latent space where it was jumping from points within the space, it really looked a lot like abstract abstract artworks. It was like this thing was learning how to, or was producing these things that were just really unique to itself. And it just struck me as having some sort of agency, but not like, I, I know I understand the technological uh, limitations, but I'm just wondering if you want to talk a little bit about that, because I think that's a really fascinating. And I wonder about how do we train something in a good way? And obviously we're failing. And I feel like things that you're doing, these gestures lead towards that training. Um, I'm just curious if you, have, if you have thoughts about that. Yeah, of course. Well, <laughs> where to start? <laughs> I mean, this is the, the central debate, really, in AI research. And I, I said at the beginning, I don't really like the term artificial intelligence, but actually, you know, for this sort of conversation, I think it has a place. I think, you know, we often... Um, do kind of exaggerate or, or you know, have this fear mongering around the term artificial intelligence, but actually as a field, I think artificial intelligence encompasses a lot more than machine learning. Machine learning is a specific engineering term. So like artificial intelligence can also encompass the policy, the uh, philosophy, the ethics, like all of these wider questions as well. Um, so yeah, when talking about artificial intelligence, I think, um, I, as an artist, started off by being incredibly interested in questions of agency and artificial consciousness and intentionality in, in you know, how far can you push an autonomous art making machine and what does that mean, right? I think my questions have shifted a bit over the years. I think especially think looking at how these things are being weaponized and used politically, I think I've become a lot more aware of the short-term ethical risks as opposed to the long-term existential risks of things like singularities and um, 
you know, AI consciousness, <laughs> which I think, to be honest, are often distractions and are often talked about more by academics and ivory towers than necessarily the sorts of people who are being affected on the streets. So I'm much more interested in, in a way, on in the research of people like um, Tim Nick Gibru and Joy Buonamwini, as opposed to someone like uh, Nick Bostrom or Max Tegmark, even though I kind of was fascinated by what Tegmark and Bostrom had to say, but, you know, also they are coming from that quite specific, you know, white privilege perspective and aren't necessarily thinking about how this is actually going to be used to govern us. Um, but that being said, there are still some fascinating conversations moving beyond data set bias and unfairness, um, which I do think does need to be our focus with policy and stuff right now. But um, I was listening recently to Stuart Russell, who's one of the most prominent AI engineers who did a, the Reefs lecture, um, which is BBC4, BBC Radio 4. Um, and he's done the Reefs lecture, which they do every year. Um, and yeah, it's brilliant. He, he kind of really does start to unpick some of these issues. But I was a bit surprised in how, in a way, it seemed to me like he was sensationalizing somewhat. But then I realized, like, no, he was actually given a very measured approach as well in sort of, you know, taking one step forward, but also taking a step back and trying to show these from different perspectives and angles. And I think, you know, an important thing to think about maybe is, you know, when, when you said that the piece latent space did something which looked like abstract expressionism that kind of makes us question how, you know, intelligent these machines are and are they being creative? It's like, well, yeah, but maybe, you know, that's actually showing us that we're not so special. And I think there's a point here, which is that we aren't necessarily trying to build an AI to be, you know, I think that's a common myth and misconception that we're trying to basically recreate human intelligence. I actually don't think engineers are working on that. Even DeepMind, who are pushing the furthest narrative of trying to create an AGI, an artificial general intelligence, right? Which is like being able to do any task that a human could do or being able to do, you know, transfer learning, but being able to recreate tasks um, and transfer it to different scopes. And effectively that could lead to a kind of super intelligence boom. Like even these sorts of concepts, they're not actually talking about creating the human brain. They're not aiming to create the human brain. They are in fact, they are neuroscientists who are creating these sorts of neural networks and trying to create AGI to understand more about our own brains. But I think in a way, the last thing on their mind is that they're trying to create consciousness. So I kind of think that this consciousness conversation can sometimes be a bit of a red herring. But at the same time, they are very much creating these incredible advanced systems to try and understand our own brains a bit better and to be able to automate tasks. But obviously, it's still always going to be a reflection of us. And when we are building these systems, we do need to be thinking really carefully about what it's learning and what it's been programmed on. And are we kind of coding uncertainty into that system? Are we able to stop it? Are we able to, you know, there are all sorts of considerations for sure around AI safety. Um, anyway, I don't know if that answers it. Sorry, that was a bit of a... No, I loved it. I loved it. It's just, it, but one of the things I was thinking about when I was watching it though, was uh, like, I have, a, I have a really good friend who's a painter and he paints in a very particular way. And the way he approaches subject matter is almost in the same way of jumping between two dimensions from points and finding the space in between the two points yeah. and painting yeah. the somethingness of something. And there was just something about the actual act of doing that felt very, just the act of looking, the act of being confused or exploring. There was something about that that I thought was very interesting. And I don't I don't know if that even touches on intelligence, but it was just more, there was something about that that felt very similar to how well, a piece of yeah. subject matter. But that's but the I, magic in how this thing is learning, for sure. And I think there is a real magic in how this thing is learning. And I think, you know, what we would call magic today would be called magic. It's like, yeah. And I, I also think relating to what you just said, kind of the in-between points, that's fascinated me for a while. I've actually written some writings on, on this, the in-betweenness in a latent space. And for me, there is this actual inherent queerness in a latent space. But it's like you said, it's learned the in-betweens. It's not being given human binaries and human classifications. I mean, it does, that's the end point, is that we are you know, using supervised learning to say, can you please classify this dog from this cat? But before that, the, the one layer before that is this multidimensional mathematical space where everything is reduced to these mathematical points. And that is beautiful. So it's like, I mentioned before the AI that was trained on uh, the not safe for workplace, the explicit images, right? 
but it hadn't learned the difference between different sexualities, between female and male genitalia. It had learned what these things all had in commonality, right? So it's like, in a way, you were able to move in this space and it didn't have those labels. So it's beautiful to watch because it's like, these are intersex images, right? <laughs> it's like, there is this queerness. And again, like you say, a painter is searching for those in-between and outside spaces. It's those spaces of otherness, those spaces of queerness. And, and that kind of exists in the way that machine learning works. And, you know, I kind of feel like the que consciousness question and agency question doesn't even relate to that, really. Like, there's so much to unpick there in the first place and so much to unpick in terms of also what, what is the data and what are those in-between spaces and who falls into them and who falls outside of it altogether still. You know, women of colour and trans people often. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, we had uh, Spella Petrick, who, who, who's... Um, training AIs to play with plants. And she was talking about like, how do you train something without actually placing labels? And that was something that she and the engineers she was working on were, were really were, were struggling with. Like, how do you, how can you train something without starting with these spots on a grid? And how, how do you, I don't know, it was just something that I found very compelling with, with the idea of training and rethinking how we train these types of AIs or machine, I mean, machine learning. Um, I did have one other question, but maybe somebody else wants to ask a question before I jump into my next one. Uh, yeah, I actually have a question. Um, it's funny that you actually chose the scene you did for the ZZ and me, because uh, when I was watching that earlier, that's the scene that <laughs> kind of stood out to me. And um, it's because uh, during that scene, uh, ZZ says the line, I'm a girl. And then uh, me, <laughs> me, the drag queen, takes a comedic pause. And um, it, it kind of felt like a, uh, it was a highlight of the fact that, like, as a drag queen, the assignment of boy or girl is complex. But also as deep fake, the assignment of boy or girl is complex. So I was just thinking, uh, how do you see the, the, how do you see your form of AI art uh, playing with or against notions of gender and gender performance? Yeah, really interesting question. Also, I love the fact that you picked up on that. <laughs> I don't think that many people do. And it was, it was very intentional. We actually added a whole extra bar of pause after that for people to just think about it. <laughs> um, but like you say, yeah, there's these two constructions here, the construction of the fact that they're an AI and the construction of the fact that drag is also a conceit around gender. Um, I think, yeah, in my recent work, it, it, there has been a lot of thinking about exactly that so how how we perform gen in relation to ai so you know i think there are so many examples of how these systems are reinforcing harmful gender stereotypes right whether that be with um you know uh, women and feminine people like being less likely to receive, I don't know, a, a bank loan or getting a lower mortgage or, you know, not being recognized. Like there are so many different levels. Almost every system can kind of find ways in which there is that gender imbalance because it's been coded, obviously also racially, also every other marginalized community. Um, but in terms of gender, there are some really quite interesting ones to unpick. So I also think like I've been thinking for a while about what would ZZ's voice be, right? So I'd want to give ZZ a, a, a non-binary voice, which I think is another interesting thing because actually they're almost all, you know, uh, voice assistants are gendered and often they tend to be gendered as female and kind of subservient. And there's all these kind of harmful reinforced stereotypes in the fact that your Google Maps or that your Alexa or your Siri is gendered in a certain way, right? Um, Copenhagen Pride and Equal AI actually made a... Uh, non-binary voice for the first time called Q, which was great. Um, and now another company, Accenture in Edinburgh, have also created the second one. So I've actually got the source code for that. So I'm kind of playing with it at the moment and working out how it can be used. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a reflection. You know, obviously these systems are reflections of us. So if we live in a racist, misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, society, then we are going to create systems which are racist, transphobic, misogynistic, prejudiced, bigoted, all the rest. So it's like, yeah, it's 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 reflecting us. And, and I think we've just got to be aware of that and make more policy and 
think harder about you know making sure there are people there in the room from the start to make sure that everyone is actually represented and these systems aren't doing harmful things yep. I agree. <laughs> did you have another question Kwame? oh no that's it well that was actually a really good jumping point because that you said something um you you posed a question do we really want to be recognized by these systems and i actually think this is a really key 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 question and uh, so i mean uh, even thinking back to dazzle camouflage and there's been a lot of artworks like cv dazzle and works that are about as you like maybe dirtying the system or or culture jamming or being activist and i think that there's something really um there's something almost powerful being in that space, especially when you have a system that's being controlled and, and being um, structured in such a very particular way. So I'm curious about what you have to say about activism and and I, I just, just talk a little bit about that area because I think the area is really, uh, it's scary in a lot yeah, of ways. For sure. Um... Well, there's an interesting researcher called Morgan Klaus Sherman in America who was looking at like how for trans people, they're like constantly being misgendered in the street. And this is a real form of like adding to gender dysphoria. If you're thinking that every CCTV system, every facial recognition system is going to be constantly misgendering you. And that's a really interesting one. Talk about like the mental health of being you know people in the trans community like how how they are seen and how they are read and do we not want to recognize so like you just mentioned dazzle makeup there's the um what they call the dazzle gang on instagram the dazzle um you probably know there's the, the, the there's a group on instagram which do all the dazzle makeup stuff which is great but again that is literally just putting makeup across their face in such a way that they no longer get seen as a human and it's interesting, this whole idea of obfuscation that actually comes from uh, basically when old warships, they would literally paint <laughs> on them zigzags, which were, I think, was it like half the length of the radar the sonar was meant to be picking up the ship? So it's basically how to like break that system they so hired, that they are no longer... Huh? They hired painters, like well-known painters. Yeah. Valley. They literally, yeah, they, they painted these designs. I mean, it's amazing. So they wouldn't get picked up by the technologies of the time. And that's, again, what we're doing. And Zach Blass did um, some lovely projects as well with kind of jewellery to kind of obfuscate CCTV systems. Um, Joy Bualamwini has done some workshops actually looking at how, you know, we can use drag makeup to sort of change uh, how we are read or not be read at all. But of course, these are for systems of governments and, and oppression, you know, when we're talking about security, we're talking about facial recognition. For other systems, it's obviously incredibly important that we are recognised. Um, if you can't get into your phone, if you can't access your bank, I don't know, all sorts of things, all sorts of rights that can be taken away from us if we aren't recognised as humans. So there is you know obviously it has to be done in a very thoughtful way and you know i'm i'm very interested in again sort of what i'm doing and what i hope more people will start to do is creating their own data sets creating their own systems looking at ways that we can move away from state operated kind of corporate systems and and kind of think about how we can play with that um either for art or actually for other applications and create these much more ethical systems where people can really understand where their data is being used and how um i think uh, it's definitely worth looking at some resources on people who are much more articulate on this area than me um there's um uh, look up, yeah, Coded Bias was a film that Joy Balamwini made recently with her Algorithmic Justice League. You've probably all seen that. Uh, it was interesting in, in exploring some things. I'm not sure if it was the best documentary, but it was, you know, it was really compelling, like some of the things that they are exploring. Um, there's Race After Technology by Ruha Benjamin, which is really interesting, kind of talking about race in these systems. And also um, Legacy Russell's Glitch Feminism, another really interesting kind of book, sort of looking at feminism, but through kind of the idea of the glitch and the idea of, yeah, how can we break out of this? system but how do we use this system how do we empower ourselves with these systems um but yeah i don't know i mean i don't have the answer there's there's always this there's always in queer theory as well this whole conflict between do we want to be recognized do we want to be represented or do we not want to be represented do we want to be other <laughs> do we you know is it assimilation if we are kind of somehow recognized and you know 
included do we want to try and stand out of that system stand outside of it and there is always that sense as well that we don't why why should google be colonizing i don't know drag king communities or going to some remote part of the world and training their AIs on, on that culture. It's like, do they need that? But then sometimes they do. Sometimes it could be really beneficial. So it's always going to be, you know, there's no answer. It's just, we need to be aware of these questions, I think, when looking at looking at all of these things for a critical gaze, I guess. So even having the conversation and hearing both sides, I mean, it's, I think that's really important. So I think it's really important that you're doing the work that you're doing so that these conversations can be had. So I think that's, that's really important as well. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. I guess so. It's half. It's half at ten where I am now, um, and I'm probably gonna run off to a drag venue in a bit. <laughs> That's great. Well, are, are there any other questions for uh, Jake? Well, we have him for another second here. All right. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. <laughs> it was. It was great. Uh, Jake, and thank you so much for uh, agreeing to spend time with us this evening. It was great to see the work and, and hear about the work uh, through, your own, um, through your own voice. And um, I wish you a wonderful evening. <laughs> you too, thank you. And this will stay up on YouTube, is that right, Michael? Yes, it will. Uh, uh, yeah, it will. I think we're gonna have, I think we'll, we'll I think at the moment we'll, um, sorry, I just, Jane, you sent a note saying it looks like you might be misidentified on YouTube at the moment, but we'll, if that's the case, we'll fix that. Yeah, no, it was just the, the name from the last speaker. So anyway, that'll get changed instantly and we'll be back. It'll be yeah, yeah. The ghost in the machine is playing with us. So we'll go and fix that. So anyway, <laughs> that's right. great. And I want to thank everybody else for coming out. And I'll just mention that uh, we'll have another AI talk series uh, starting up in the winter. And the first one's going to be with... Uh, Alain Thibault from Montreal. He'll be here talking about Electra and is it B-I-A-N or B-I-A-N? Uh, the B-I-A-N. Yeah, the B-I-A-N. Okay, great. And that's going to happen on January 20th at 3 p.m. So, all right, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful holiday and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. And thanks again, Jake. Thank you so much, Jake. Take care. <laughs>